here, of course, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have a slide presentation, of course, which I tend to more produce for the audience to read afterwards than necessarily to follow. Um, so uh, I have had a few um, reflections on what I have heard that might be worth um, just um, starting off with. The first one is, of course, a very general one, and that is that any government has as one of its obligations to ensure that its citizens can live in a reasonable standard of living and have, any, have something meaningful to do. And that goes without saying, but it's frequently occasionally forgotten. Uh, and that means that we need to have an economic structure that enables that to happen. And just to give you some, some feelings looking at the future, not of manufacturing, but to start with some of the other areas, uh, and that is um, the resources industry. You know, um, most mines, I mean, they, especially in Australia now, where it's gone from an exploration to a productivity phase, where we will continue to produce more and more out of these mines with substantially less and less people. You know, the normal mine will maybe operate with a remote center with about 50 people. Uh, there will be nobody in the mine. I've been at the smelter, where the smelter operates 24-7 with four people. Okay. So you can realize that the productivity that we will have in Australia and mining industry when it adopts those international best practices will be around about 150,000 people less required than it is today. And that's going to happen reasonably quickly. The other one to reflect on is agriculture. Agriculture has had an unbelievable productivity improvement. And the productivity improvement of the last 100 years has by far exceeded the demand increase which means that we produce much more food than ever before with substantially less people. It's not that agriculture is less important to us. It's just that we do much more with much fewer people. And of course, manufacturing has a similar pattern. So if you look at that, uh, the reason why employment in manufacturing generally tends to decrease is uh, that the productivity improvement on average exceeds the demand increase for those industries. In other words, we can supply the demand with less people. Now, the way to go about this, of course, is to ensure that you are um, growing broadly faster than your productivity improvement exceeds your demand increase in the narrow sector. What that, of course, also means that the area where most people will be employed is services. But we um, have to be very careful about understanding what that means, because there are basically three types of services. There are high-value-added services, which are all basically, with some very, very few exceptions, linked to manufacturing. Most services in the world that are high-value-added are either delivered by manufacturing firms on behalf of manufacturing firms or to manufacturing firms. So if you lose them, you lose the service. 75% of Swedish service export, and Sweden has one of the highest service exports in the world, is linked to physical products. The physical products disappear, the service goes away. The rest of the services is what we call low-value-adding services, and they all suffer from Baumol's disease, which means you can't increase the productivity. You know, I have a symphony orchestra. It's very difficult to play faster with fewer people, you know, it, and, which would be productivity improvement. It's just not possible you know, in some of those areas. So this is something we tend to forget. And that is usually why manufacturing is so important, because it is a driver of very many things. And it was mentioned earlier, of course, that manufacturing is a very high contributor to research and development, which is absolutely true. Just to put some rough numbers on the, the automotive industry in Australia has on average three times the R&D spending of rest of manufacturing. So that's one consequence of them leaving that is worth reflecting on. I have a number of things that I will cover, um, but I'm not going to go through all of them. So the first thing I thought is a little bit around the kind of macro level. And, and the key issues that, that are, so I'm not going to talk about things. We will talk about technology and a few things about that. Sam will talk about a few other things. But what I'll talk a little bit around, and I'll think that forward, is, is the workforce component on the macro level. And it has been mentioned, but I will say a few things about it. And the first message is the top one, which you've heard again. STEM, 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 STEM. It is fundamental. Tomorrow's manufacturing, and even today's manufacturing, will require STEM skills in every single job. And most of it will relate short-term to ICT-related activities. 
but that requires mathematics, there will be requirements of understanding basic physics, there will be some understanding requirements on chemistry, and in another set of industries there will be about biology in the broadest sense. And this is not about purely the products, it's also about the production equipment and, and how things are produced, the processes. I mean, if you're looking at chemical issues, the future chemical industry will to a very large extent be biotechnology based. Microbial consortia engineering is the technology that's going to come along and do that. And I'm not sure how much of you are familiar with that, but that basically is that we are creating a whole set of different bacteria that didn't exist before, and that we put them together in a vat and they do what we want them to do, you know, it's simplistically expressed. And that is allowing ourselves to use sunlight and other things to drive production equipment and at a very low cost, maybe a little bit slower initially, maybe a little bit lower yields, but it will be very cheap to do. And that is replacing hugely energy intensive, uh, very large capital intensive chemical industries. And that means you need to understand those things. So that's your production process in the industry that you need to understand. Then, of course, you need to understand the process computers. You need to understand the robotics and how to program them. You need to understand how to operate those things. Anybody ever been in what's called a black factory? In other words, a factory with no light and no people that works 24-7? No, no. No? They are growing at a speed you wouldn't believe. Okay? They are factories producing things. I've been in a number of them. And there's one guy running them, okay? And he is usually a, a previous blue-collar worker that's been upskilled dramatically, and he runs these things on a 24-7 basis and they're replaced every eighth hour. It's one guy running a factory. And that, of course, is extremely productive. So don't forget that historically, machines were there to assist people. Today, people are there to assist machines. You know, and that is a fundamental change in attitude. The other thing we look at is, of course, uh, we need to have a higher level of education because th th this is not sufficient what you get in your basic schooling. You need higher levels. And when you start to look at modern manufacturing, and that means advanced manufacturing, the lowest level is basically of education that you find in those companies is basically the highest level of that or, more commonly, the equivalent of a bachelor's degree. So the thing that if you're without education, you can go and work in manufacturing, that's gonna go away. Where you will get a job if you have no education, that will be in healthcare, where you will be used to move physically things around. That's where your low education people will get the job. They are not gonna get a job in manufacturing. No. And uh, of course, uh, that has a major implication for today's workforce that needs to be upskilled about these things. So that's the first issue. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, um, the uh, key issues on the firm level. You can read the rest on yourself. So the key issue is productivity. A country live on its ability to increase productivity faster than others. That's what we live on. Uh, and Australia, we have not been very good at that on the whole we have actually lagged behind dramatically on our productivity increase. I mean, the average productivity increase in countries like US and, and Germany and so on hovers around about between four and 6%, depending on how you measure it. Australia has been just around 2% on average. And that doesn't sound a lot of a difference, but if you add it up over 10, 20 years, it makes a huge difference. And that means that at the moment, uh, the productivity improvements in Australia are not cumulatively sufficient to maintain the living standard that we presently have. And you will see that because that is very clearly evidenced in growing budget deficits because we have awarded ourselves things we can't afford. Uh, and that, over time, will force one of two things to happen. Either we decrease our living standard that means, you know, you have to pay more for Medicare, you don't get, uh, you know, free transportation. All those things will have to happen, L you know, lower pensions and all the stuff. Or you increase the ability to create value. But if you're going to create, increase the ability to create value, you have to have the skills to do so and the industrial structure to do so. And there we have a, a whole host of issues. So productivity are driven by these, these issues. So... If we start from the top, and I'm going to briefly just cover them, uh, the first one, of course, is managerial competence. It's very, very clear 
that uh, increasing managerial competence uh, increases productivity. Many studies show it. You know, the Australian one that people may be familiar with, of course, is the one that Roy Green did. And what it shows is that the, um, Australia is a second-rate nation when it comes to managerial skills. And, and why is that? You know, people here are not more stupid than anywhere else. You know, we are as about as smart as anybody else. What it has to do is the, the ability to learn you know, the opportunity to be exposed to good practice. Because you do not learn good management skills by going to a business school. You know, at a business school, you learn the language to talk about managerial issues with great distinctions. You don't know how to do it. You don't learn how to do it. The way to learn to do it is to work in extremely capable firms where you are taught what it takes to do well. That means you need to work in industries that are global and exposed to high competition. We really don't have any of those in Australia. You know, one of the few exceptions is automotive, otherwise we really don't have those firms. So that means that people don't get that opportunity. If you work in Germany or Switzerland or Sweden, you have hundreds of multinationals and even more, thousands of SMEs that are global and that are doing very well. And when you work in them, you learn without noticing what it takes. You understand the importance of processes. You understand the importance of skills, how to combine these things, how to manage the people side. That is why the average CEO for a small firm in that part of the world comes to that firm with 10 years of experience having run a P&L responsible component of a large global multinationals. So they come with the skills. That is one of the reasons. So we have to really up our game on that level because the managerial skill is critical. Uh, we need high you know, quality work systems and high performance work system and they are generally made up of those things kind of generically. Um, the, the key thing we know from research is that if you put one of them in, it ain't gonna make any difference whatsoever. It is the complete suite of them that makes a difference. And we also know they don't work in all situations, but they do work in some situations. Uh, so we need to be better at doing these things uh, and understand what they are and understand that you can't cherry pick. It's a systemic change that you're looking for. Um, we spoke about this in the introduction. I cannot emphasize it enough, the quality of labor, the quality of capital. I would say as a rule of thumb, if you look at the average manufacturing firm, uh, you should invest minimum 5% of your turnover in R&D, minimum 5% annually in upgrading your capital equipment, and minimally 5% a year in upgrading your people. If you don't do that, you'll slip behind. And by the way, if you want a rule of thumb, the average manufacturing company in those big countries that do well increase their productivity every year by 5%. 5% per year. Right. And you need to do that. And that means, I mean, I have people coming to me and they proudly say that they managed to find some used piece of equipment, uh, seven years old, that they bought very, very cheaply and they're very proud of it. Yeah? So I say to them, fantastic, you've just reduced your financial flexibility and you're guaranteed that you're going to be uncompetitive. Well done. Yeah? It's unbelievably erroneously thought. Right. You need to be at the top end because the technology development is embodied in the capital equipment that you use. And if you're going to be on top of the game, you need the best capital equipment. When was the best time to invest in the most expensive, sophisticated capital equipment you could buy? It was when the dollar was high. How many people did it? Of course, that you couldn't have bought the best stuff cheaper than then, right? Don't come to me and complain now when you want to buy it and life is expensive. You could have bought it two years ago. Yeah? Key enabling technologies. I'm sure we will talk more about that. I just touched on a few things. Uh, key enabling technologies is um, the technologies that have two characteristics. One is that they underpin productivity improvement in almost all industries. And the second one is they form industries in their own right. Classic example is ICT. So ICT is used in almost all industries to improve productivity, but there's also such a thing as an ICT industry. 
right? Uh, likewise, you have the other one, you have all this kind of stuff, be it photonics or whatever. They'll, they impact productivity improvement in almost every other industry through sensors and things like that, communication tools that are using light, you name it, energy tools that cut steel, all of those are based on photonics. Uh, and uh, they also are an industry in their own right. So what it means here is that we need to master these domains. And you will be familiar with the fact that both Europe and uh, US and Japan have an extremely high focus on mastering these technology domains as a basis for advanced manufacturing of the future. And we have to do the same. But the mastery is not only about universities, or not even primarily about universities. It's primarily about mastery on the level of the firm. Companies need to know what these things mean. They need to understand them, they need to be able to deploy them. That's very, very important. We need to do R&D, I mentioned that before, R&D capital formation. But we also need to understand that R&D and innovation are two different things, which is why I have them on two different slides. So research and development, basically very, very few companies do research. Very few, you know, pharmaceuticals, yes. And then, you know, you have the odd one. But apart from that, they most do D. Uh, and the universities do R. So research is basically the conversion of knowledge to money, uh, sorry, money to knowledge. That's what research is. You spend money, you get some knowledge. Doesn't mean you make any money at all. It's a, it's a, it's a cost center in that area. Whereas innovation is the ability to convert that knowledge to money. Uh, and what we need to do is to connect the two better than we do. In other words, Australia comes out extremely high in all the supply side issues on research. You know, we spend a lot on research. There's a lot of research productivity on universities. We can argue how it's measured and if it's the right measure, but the way it is measured shows high research productivity. We are extremely poor on research on company levels, and there is a very poor linkage between what firms do and what universities do, hence the inability to convert that insight into money on the firm level. And part of that is due to the skill level, and part of it's due to managerial competence. But the skill also relates to managers in that broader sense, and part of the problem or opportunity, depending on how you look at it, is of course that most SMEs are started in Australia by people that does not have a university education. There's nothing right and wrong with that per se, but what it means is that they are not familiar with how to interact with universities. So they look at the university as a strange beast, okay, and don't want to go in there because it's complicated and full of barriers and all kinds of funny things. And that is not then helped by universities having perverse boundary conditions. That means that if you work with industry, you get penalized compared to sitting and writing an article that nobody reads. Right? So there is there's all kinds of issues around that, and we really need to work on both sides of that. And innovation, of course, is the key. Innovation is the lifeboat of industry, and we need to be extremely good to innovate in what we do. And innovation drives anything you can think of. But not all innovation is technical. There is innovation that relates to non-technical activities. There is innovation that's driven by our ability to learn by doing, by using, by interacting. And we go into a bit, but Sam will talk more about those things. That underpins what we know as design, for example. But it also requires different skills. It means that we need to have the ability to interact, the ability to build relationships, the ability to use these relationships very well. And that is what is sometimes erroneously in my mind, but gen generically called soft skills. In my opinion, they're about as hard as any other skills if you put them to use. But we need to have those skills, and people need to be very good at them. Engineers used to be very proud of saying, we don't deal with people, we deal with machine, and people are horrible things, and we put them very difficult. You know, that is an engineer of yesterday. Today's engineer needs to understand how to work with people, how to build relationship, and how to leverage those relationships for innovation. And as manufacturing firms build services, which they do because the value-adding potential in the production stage is decreasing, whereas the value-adding potential in the pre- and post-production stages are increasing, so they need to build those type of services to retain a standard productivity and production um, value creation opportunity. Uh, and as they do that, they need to have people skills, they need to have team uh, building and team working skills, they need to have relationship developing skills. Without that, you can't servitize as a manufacturing firm, and if you can't servitize, your productivity will not be fast enough, and your profitability will go down, and you will go under. Uh, there is something about the structure in which you operate and how that drives um, 
productivity. You know, if you are too small in an industry that requires size, you will go under. If you're too large in an industry that requires nimble, continuous change, you will go under. So you have to have kind of an optimal size. And that depends if you are in economies of scope, economies of scale, or network economic type industries. And it requires you to understand how your industry changed between these different issues and the implication that has for your optimal scale level. And that is frequently forgotten as well. Uh, and that, of course, is why Australia, with its very relatively small domestic market, that uh, on the whole must have firms. It's the kind of sweet spot of Australian manufacturing. It's high variability, high complexity, high value adding, and profitable at low volumes. Right? That's, that's generally what the sweet spot is here. And you think about those 7% of Australian manufacturing companies that do exceedingly well, they tend to sit in that box whereas the ones who sit outside that box don't generally do very well or are struggling. So uh, that's important. Productivity spillovers are important, um, and, and that is the ability to generally sit in together with others. Okay? Um, and the easiest term of that is, is clusters, and clusters has been proven to work very well. Uh, somewhere on the slide there, it says a few numbers that if you, if you work together with others, you know, you have about a 14% productivity, sorry, higher value added growth, you have a 7% points higher profitability growth, and 2 percentage point higher wage per employee, in other words, a proxy for productivity growth. In other words, it's been clearly measured in tens of thousands of companies comparing inside-outside clusters that being in a cluster is hugely profitable. Uh, and that's a typical operationalization of a productivity spillover effect. And, and that is why proximity works in those type of areas and why it measures. And that means we need to learn on how to cooperate, even how to cooperate with people that we compete with. You know, the cooperation approach is quite normal out there, and we need to be very, very good at that. And we are, unfortunately, at the moment, not very good. We need to ensure that we expose people to competition, uh, because if we don't, they go under. And as you can see, the reason is on this top, top point there. And that is a bit of a problem, because uh, you can survive uh, if you avoid competition by having, for example, a geographical monopoly. Uh, and one of, you can see industries where this has happened. Uh, printing used to be one of those. I was the only printer in town, and it didn't really matter whether I was productive or not. You know, people went to me because the cost barriers to go somewhere else was too high. Now, as that industry gets exposed to removing the physical barriers to distribution because of digitalization, these people disappear. Uh, and, and, of course, being far away in a place that isn't LinkedIn is a larger version of the same issue. And I think that is, that is quite important. Um, how many of you have been to what is now the fastest growing and most successful manufacturing hub in Asia, which is Rayon in Thailand? It's worth a visit. It makes your mind really understand what's happening, you know, and why we are so way behind on that, right? Thailand is really doing exceedingly well, and skill is one of the key offerings they have to people who are established there, right? Also to see what's happened in, in South Korea over the last 10 years or so, what's happening in China and all those things. And China now is changing structures, you well know. The average Chinese manufacturing cost as a labor unit, in other words, the salary and associated cost for manufacturing in eastern China is round about next year going to be on the same level as U.S. So you don't go to China to cut cost. Okay, that's not why you go there. I mean, the companies who were cost-oriented, they left China about 15 years ago. You know, and they went to Vietnam, and now they're in the process of leaving Vietnam. So if you are really in the cost issue and looking at China, you're so far behind the ball, you don't even know where the ball is. All right? It's one of those things. So there's, it's really an issue about understanding these things. You go to China for other reasons. It's a large market, and you want to serve that. You go there because you're choosing to outsource administrative or R&D type activities, so service outsourcing. You don't go there to put manufacturing any longer. That's, that's not why you go there. Um, we need to be smarter at using regulation. And of course, part of that is deregulation in order to remove unnecessary cost for firms. But the other one is actually to put in regulations that forces firms to innovate. Um, the, the world leader in that field as a jurisdiction is California. It's always been. 
You know, they put in regulations that forces companies to do things they don't know how to do, and if they can't do it, they are not allowed to sell their products in California. Classic example is automotive. You know, you know they, they say, okay, they want to force the lambdas on to be put in in order to have exhaust management issues. Uh, and they are the ones who have required for, uh, cars to use, I forgot where it's 40 or 60%, I always forget the number, of the energy the sun generates through the glass in order to use that for something useful in the car. If you can't do that, you can't sell the car in California. And of course, when every time this happens, the automotive industry wails and says it's outrageous and how can they do this to us? And of course, the right answer to that is what one of the guys in the Californian um, public sector said. I think it was under Arnie's leadership. Um, but they, he, they said, OK, um, asked how a company is going to solve that. The answer was, I have no idea. Okay. That's why we have companies. They'll work it out. Because if they don't, they can't sell the product here and they can't afford not to. Right? It's exactly the right answer. You know, you have the same issues how you're driven, you know, issues around the energy efficiency, carbon scenarios in, in Europe, Germany and Scandinavia, where you actually put in a barrier for firms. They have to achieve certain things. But the barrier is put in because the expectation is that other countries will put in a similar barriers. And hence, by forcing these companies to find a way to re-improve the productivity, having now decreased it for them, you're making those firms better fit to take a world leadership once other th countries put in the same thing because they have a competitive advantage that drives a global industry, which is why you find that these, these countries have firms that are world leaders in these domains. And as those become commoditized and move to other countries, they move on to the next one because nothing stays forever. And then we also have to realize that we have to have continuity. We had a gentleman over from the Fraunhofer Institute who spoke to us last week, and, and, um, you know, and, and he said a number of good things. But one of the key things that, that came through in the message, and I'm going to repeat it, is that they have had an industry policy that is agreed bipartisanly, and it stays in place no matter what happens to government. And that means that companies know the rules of the game, they know the objective, they know the boundary condition, they can plan for them, and that means they can invest in things because most investments are 10 to 20 year horizon issues if they have a strategic nature, and they know that the world will look the same from a boundary condition point of view and the objectives within that area. Whereas if we throw it around every third year, no company will do anything because it's just not clear enough. You can't get the horizon line, you'll put it elsewhere. Uh, in that sense. And we have, mustn't forget that all global supply chains are internal markets, and every single entity in them have to compete on a daily basis for access to capital based on what they can do with it. And if you don't do it well here, you will do it well somewhere else. Uh, I'm not going to go through all that, but you can see some of these things in my little nice slide here. Uh, what we want is a lead market, and, and there are some issues about doing that. And so the question is, where can Australia become a lead market? Because if you can become a lead market, you become the right geographical location for activities. If you are the right geographical location for activities, you will build clusters. If you build clusters and serve the world from there, you will become competitive, you develop the skill areas, and you will become a world leader in those domains. And normally it means that you have extremely demanding customers. Because remember, no product will be built better than there is a demanding customer to ask for it. Okay? So you need an extremely demanding customer to require you to do things that are so good that you are forced to develop them and they don't exist, and then you can sell them elsewhere. That's really, really important. And the, if you want an industry policy that's going to kill your industry, I have one, it works every time, okay? And that is that you are a dominating player in the market and you only buy off-the-shelf proven solutions, okay? Then you guarantee to kill your own industry. And the reason, of course, is that you can't innovate because nobody will take it. So the only people who can sell it are those that can innovate elsewhere and then come with a proven solution because it was somebody else who was willing to try it first. And if you are here, they will come in, they will do a better job, and they kill you off. That's a guaranteed way of killing your industry. It works every single time. It's a perfect policy from that point of view. We also have to have flexible input markets. I do commend the Danish uh, FlexiCure to you, the ability that you can get rid of people very quickly, but the people have a route through which they can upskill while they are gone to find another job afterwards. This ability to create an incredibly flexible labor market while still respecting the individuals involved. 
that is a really important issue because it's very clear that by putting in barriers uh, for that type of necessary movements in and out, we reduce the opportunity to create productivity and we slowly kill off our industries in that area. We also have to have a demand and we are back to government as a very important player in the demand area. Uh, you know, it, there are many studies that show that if you have extremely sophisticated system projects uh, and government ask for things that don't exist and you have a domestic system integrator, you can buy 60% of the widgets from offshore, then you have a huge productivity spillover in the domestic economy. In the US it's about six times the value you spend. In Sweden, it's 2.6 times the value you spend. In Germany, probably about 3. Australia would estimate 1.5, but you still have a really high spillover. So it is much more profitable to buy things that don't exist than to buy off the shelf. But it requires a strategic perspective rather than a tunnel vision to do that. And that's really, really important. So. Here are some things you can look at your general issue. It's around what it is that requires you to do. Uh, these are um, some key issues that firms should strive to have, and you can see a lot of them are a lot of them are linked to skill, either directly or indirectly, in this domain. And the government must create an environment in which winners can emerge. They should, under no circumstances, pick winners because they have no idea how to do that but they should create an environment in which winners can emerge. And then they should kill off losers. No, that's my favorite industrial euthanasia policy. And every time I say that word, politicians shiver. There we go. But it is really important. You need to kill them off quickly because they sit on, on underutilized resources. And you need to get them out of the system so you can recreate and redistribute those resources. Uh, don't keep them under this area. And then we also have to be honest about what it is we do in this country. I mean, there are really no, uns if you use the word subsidy, you know, which by the way I do not necessarily like, but if you use that word in general common, there are really no unsubsidized industries. You know, over the last 10 years, yeah, automotive got about, what, 1.3 billion? Food got about 1.4, mining 2.6. Superannuation, 32 billion, okay? So, you know, you tell me an industry that isn't subsidized. It's just a matter of how you subsidize it. So, you know, you have to be very careful about all those banding things around. Everything is subsidized in this country. It's just a matter of how you do it, you know? Do you do it through custom barriers? Do you go to handouts? Do you give them to this, that, and the other? So, you know, we have a weaning off exercise to do, and that is quite painful. And for companies, it will be very, very painful. And um, one of those things, in my humble opinion, is get rid of all grants and move over to soft loans. It's a really good idea, because then everybody gets skin in the game. Yeah, you may not get all of the money back, but you get substantially more back than if you give out grants. Uh, and also, by the way, R&D tax credits don't work. Okay? And the reason they don't work is that people do the R&D they need to do anyway, and then they look at this money and they say, free money, how do I get at that? And they sit down with their very clever accountants and work out a little scheme and they reclassify their secretary to R&D management and they become eligible for R&D grants. And then, you know, they get the money. They don't do more, but by having done this, they report more. So on the macro level, it looks like it works. You, know? you spend more on it and it looks like you get more reported R&D. But if you go in and look at the firm level, nothing happens, with one exception. Very small startup companies with no balance sheet and negative cash flow, and the R&D is paid up front. But with the exception of that, it's an absolute waste of money. I'll stop there, I think, with my little tirade, and then I'm happy to take the odd question if there is one. And otherwise, complex questions will be referred to long answers will take place at 3 o'clock, I have been told. Uh, otherwise, uh, relatively simple, short and sharp questions are taken now. Is that a reasonable issue? Question. Can you tell me more about the Danish reskilling? And we, we have yeah. a trained microphone runner. Can you just wave your microphone up there? And we have yeah. another one over there. So look to those, wave, make a gesture. So yeah. Well, it's called here. FlexiCure, and you can look it up at the internet. But you know, if I brutally simplify it, it's much more complex than this. What it means is that if I no longer need you, uh, I can tell you to go and you're gone on Monday. 
but I have the obligation to keep a kind of competence profile on you. So I know what the capability issues are that you're deficit in, deficient, in, deficient in. And then you, there is a plan immediately when you go on to training those things. And you retain while you're on training a salary level which is lower than the one you had. And then you're obliged to accept any job that pays equal to a higher and your new salary level. And if you don't do that, you drop again. So, you know, there is a strong incentive to accept a new job, and if you do well in that, you will go up over time. But there is also a requirement to upskill you, and the firms have to upskill the people on a regular basis and keep a map on what they are still missing, and that's the one you develop them on. So it's a continuous upskilling simultaneously to increase flexibility. Very simplistically and brutally generalized as a, as a principle to that, yeah. Other questions, if I can see anything out here? There we go, Bob. Yeah, Joran, um, with the, your, uh, you spoke about demanding customers and so on. Yep. Uh, often uh, government is the uh, customer for yep. a, a lot of uh, manufacturing input and so on, particularly related to um, defence, sorry, defence and uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. work and so on. How does one stimulate governments to become demanding customers in that sense? I'm not sure the word stimulate is the right word. But, uh, but anyway, I, I think there is an issue to... The, the first thing, I think, is to, to, to have an educational session. And, and that has to do with the, the ability to, to realise how th that the procurement system needs to change. And there are usually there are, there are a number of problems or challenges here. The first one is that what you pay up front is actually irrelevant. It's the life cycle cost of what you buy that matters. And that means you need to move to a life cycle costing evaluation scenario. Because at the moment, that really doesn't happen. People only talk about the upfront cost. And obviously, if I'm a very clever manufacturer, what I do is I do a loss leader strategy. So I offer something incredibly low price upfront, and then I sting you all the way through the 10 years you're using it. And I walk away with a huge amount of profit, and you have no idea what happened to you. Okay? So, so, so you need to understand how to work on the, on the life cycle costing scenario. Uh, this, the second issue uh, you need to know is that, that frequently in government, project management responsibilities are frequently separate from risk management responsibilities. And that means, of course, that uh, whereas the project manager wants to get an outcome, the risk manager wants to avoid risk. And the best way to avoid risk is A, to do nothing, okay? or if you have to do something, do exactly the same as you did last time. Right? So that's a guaranteed way of ensuring no innovation whatsoever in this scenario. You need to get out of that. Then you also need to copy some really smart process, and I know that that has been done, and since I had a finger in writing original documents, they've done both in Victoria and South Australia around the SBIR programs. This issue that, that in the US, it's the most successful um, program in the US. They, they label it the venture capital program. It's actually it's a procurement program. So what you do is that every federal authority has to put aside 2.5% of their procurement budget into a pile that they really can't touch. And then they have to list the problems that they have that, if solved, would dramatically improve their performance in delivering what they need to deliver, but they don't know how to solve it. And then you can come up with a really good idea, and you don't even need to exist as a company. You just come in and say, I have a great idea how to deal with this. And they will then do two things, simplistically expressed. They will say, would this thing, if it would work, you know, do the job? And B, do I think you can make it happen? Okay, so those are the two evaluation criteria. The only requirement is it cannot be off the shelf. It has to be something that does not exist. Okay? And then they buy it as a prototype purchase on milestones, which you can do without going to tender. You know, and, and the, because that's well under the WTO. So the key thing about WTO is to understand it well enough to know how to play it, okay? So, and the Americans are very good at this. So, the, and that means that you then do this. And then, of course, you get your first issue, and then they try it, it works, and then they put it out for tender with the specification in it, which, of course, you win because you're the only one how to do this. And then you have the basis for building a company. And to give you the success rate, two criteria. Number one is evaluated every year. It's always come out as the highest turn, the return rate on U.S. tax dollars ever. Never touched. It's been around for close to 40 years. Number one, in its lifespan, it has created more successful companies than the total U.S. venture capital industry. Okay? Just to put it in perspective. It's an extremely successful program, uh, which, of course, is what we need to do more of. So, that, so government is an important player, and there are many things you can do, but it requires you to understand that government has this role 
and to understand these type of scenarios. And that means educating people around procurement processes, educating them on how to do these type of issues, and educating them on the role. So the issue is not to spend the lowest amount of taxpayers' money. The issue is to get the highest return on taxpayers' money. And those are two different things. Other questions and comments? In which case, I'm out of it. Very good. Total clarity reigns. Thank you very much. Thank you.